Um, I'm used to working in hour chunks, two hour chunks, three hour chunks, in which I get to do a lot of interactive stuff. Because I've only got 20 minutes, uh, I'm not going to do much interactive. But I would like to start with one little piece here. What I'd like you to do is take your pad uh, and clean, uh, clear to a fresh page. And I'd like you to do something you've done at least a thousand times, but I want you to do it in a different way. What I want you to do is sign your name. Don't print, but sign your name. But I want you to put the pad on your forehead. Put the pad. Don't poke your eye out. <clears throat> Let's see how we're doing here. Is it Karen? Uh, no. No? Is this working? Is this working at all? Yeah, just barely. Um, N? <laughs> Is it backwards, maybe? Okay. Did anybody get P, P, O, C? <laughs> Pete, Pete. Here's the winner. Pete is the winner. Are you left-handed left by chance? Right-handed. Cool. Okay. Did anybody get results that looked really good to you? <laughs> Terrific. M A Mary Etta. Terrific. But see, you printed. You didn't sign. But anyway, um, there will be there will be some carryover from what you just experienced tonight. Okay. What I've been doing for 30 years is I've been looking at what humor is. And Pete got into some of the issues about the psychology of humor. The other thing that I've been looking at for the last 22 years, I've been doing seminars for corporations and medical groups on why humor is valuable. So I want to talk about this stuff tonight. If any of it's of interest, we're only going to be scratching the surface. Um, here's a book from 2009 called Comic Relief. It's easy to spot. There are three laughing orangutans on the cover. The applied stuff, the benefits of humor, especially in the business world, are mostly from a book called Humor Works, which is published by Human Resource Development Press. The first thing I noticed about humor when I started researching it is until very recently, and pretty much just in North America, humor had a really terrible reputation. This starts with Plato, uh, several centuries BCE in ancient Greece, and it especially gets strong in the 1700s and the 1800s in Britain. Here is a quote from a famous author. Whoops, skipping back. Well, here, let's just. Here's a quote from a famous author named Lord Chesterfield in the 18th century. This is a letter to his son. Having mentioned laughing, I must particularly warn you against it. Frequent and loud laughter is the characteristic of folly and ill manners. It is the manner in which the mob express their silly joy at silly things, and they call it being merry. In my mind, there is nothing so illiberal and so ill bred as audible laughter. I'm neither of a melancholy nor a cynical disposition, but I'm and I'm apt as willing to be pleased as anybody, but I'm sure that since I had full use of my reason, nobody has ever heard me laugh. Uh, love dead, I guess. Um, here is an illustration from a book published in Victorian England that was so successful it went through three editions. It's called The Philosophy of Laughter and Smiling by George Vasey. In the book, Vasey warns against laughing. He says that when you laugh, you interfere with your breathing and the circulation of your blood. And he cites two cases of people who died laughing. He also has an aesthetic argument that laughing makes you ugly. This is a few specimens of the distortions which laughter produces on the human face. He says a little smile like this woman is okay, but when you open up and let go like this Michael Caine guy, he says it could kill you. So now. In the 20th century, I think we're doing better than thinking that laughter is going to kill us. But I think that in the field of education, the suppression of laughter is systematic and still very deep-seated. Uh, I'm one of the editors of a journal called Humor, the International Journal of Humor Research. And we published a study recently that showed Head Start teachers with three-year-olds suppressing humor. Uh, when my son Jordan was in third grade, he came home with this nine-week report in October, and one of the lines that the teacher had, all filled out, ready to check, was this one, very hard to read, refrain from attracting attention to self through sound effects. <laughs> and sh she's branded him for life as a giggler. Uh, so I think in education, the suppression of humor, and this is what keeps the suppression of humor going to each generation. The kid in school who's got some artistic ability might go to the art room. 
the kid who's got some musical talent might go to the music room, but the kid with a sense of humor goes to the principal's office, and it's still this way after all this time. One of the encouraging signs a couple years ago at the College of William and Mary where I teach, we're in the oldest college building in the country. It was completed in 1699. Uh, we had a visitor, and it was so nice to see her smile and laugh. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, this is the building where I teach, and this is our president, Gene Nickel, who's got the biggest, heartiest, grizzly bear laugh, and this is Governor Tim Kaine. It's not okay for queens to open their mouth and actually show their teeth, but she did the best she could. She raised, at least raised this finger here. So um, things, things are getting better, um, at least incrementally. Now I wanna say just two basic things about the nature of humor and laughter. First, humor is a kind of cognitive play, and I'm gonna specify what kind in a minute. And secondly, laughter is linked to play because laughter is a play signal that we inherit from pre-human apes. Play, I want to define, is activity which we pursue just for pleasure that overrides all the ordinary rules of communication, bona fide rules of communication. For example, the linguist and philosopher Paul Grice has these rules. And these are rules we break all the time when you make a joke. Do not say what you believe to be false. Well, when you're kidding somebody, you say that all the time. Do not say that for which you lack adequate evidence, when you just do wild fantasies and bullshit. Uh, so humor, is, humor allows you to break all kinds of standard rules of communication. Uh, now, you need something like laughter to signal that this is play, because as Pete pointed out, if I'm being aggressive toward you, and you can't tell that I'm only playing, you're gonna be threatened. So we need a way of saying, this is only for fun. Uh, a guy who violated this rule was Andy Kaufman, the late Andy Kaufman. And Andy Kaufman uh, crowned himself the women's wrestling champion of the world. And he went around the country for over 10 years challenging women to fight him, and he never did it with a smile, he never did it with a laugh, and as a result, he had many, many angry women beat the shit out of him in the ring. <laughs> because he didn't follow this very basic rule. Now, if I had a couple, of, couple more hours, I would talk about the theory of where laughter and smiling came from. The big theorist here is a Dutch anthropologist named Van Hoof, who for 45 years has been studying this stuff. Here's a wonderful picture from Van Hoof of a gorilla using this, this grin to get you to soften up. Uh, here's the gorillas, I mean the orangutans from the front of my book. And here's a human being doing the same thing. Okay, now, one of the things that I emphasize in talking about humor as a kind of play, especially when I talk to business groups, is that play is not the opposite of work. For most Americans, we learned at about age four or maybe five that play is okay if you don't have any responsibilities, but as soon as you have responsibilities, then you've gotta be humorless, and then you've gotta just get down to work. As a result, children, preschoolers, who laugh over 100 times a day, once they graduate, say, from high school or college, are down to under 25 laughs a day. So lots of things get lost. Along with the loss of laughter, however, goes things like imagination, the ability to see things from different points of view, and what I'm gonna call in a minute mental flexibility. Um, let me give you a simple example of how play is not the opposite of work. This comes from an advertising agency where they had a really rough month and they lost some accounts and everybody was on, just on edge. On Monday morning, the woman who ran the office said, we're gonna do something a little bit different today. We're gonna recycle advertising. I'm gonna give you a product and what you have to do is you have to give an ad line for it, but you have to use some former ad. Um, here's the product. The product was Viagra. And here are some of the recycled ad lines. Uh, this one is from the U.S. Army. <laughs> see if you can, t well see, call out where this is from, what the product was, the original product. GE, beautiful. <laughs> Burger King? I think it was Irish Spring, wasn't it? Yeah, good. <laughs> Okay. Uh, let me give you another example from the world of business how play is not the opposite of work. 
This is a two-man operation. It's a simple little plumbing company, and they had to paint their truck. <clears throat> now, by, painting their, by painting their truck that way, they get remembered throughout the community, and their business goes up. This is, the, this, is the design scheme. this is the design scheme for sheriff's cars in Corn County, in Bakersfield. Uh, in case you can't read it, we'll kick your ass and take your donuts too. <clears throat> Here's a wonderful billboard for Daisy Air Rifles. And this is from a restaurant in Kentucky where uh, incest is a problem. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, as, I, as, I've studied, as I've studied humor in the business world, one of the things that I noted right away when I started the research was that humor and high tech go together. So people in the higher tech, the higher tech you go, the more humor. Here's an article from the Washington Post called Mind Games for Tech Success. And here's a nice illustration. This is a company called Excited Home in California. And here's how you get from the second floor of the building to the first floor of the building. If you look at companies that are in the computer business, there's a fair amount of humor. For example, uh, 26, 27 years ago when IBM came out with the PC, they had a huge image problem. When you thought in the early 1980s of an IBM computer, what did you picture? A mainframe, a huge thing. It took up a room. So they had to give you the image of a small, friendly, accessible computer that, was, that you could afford and that you could touch instead of a mainframe. So who was the lead guy in their ads, it was a Charlie Chaplin character, because Charlie Chaplin was small, funny, and accessible. There's another company in California called Adaptech, which makes input-output devices. And 15 years ago, in 19, uh, 16 years ago, in 1995, they decided to put humor into their annual report to stockholders. Here's their annual report to stockholders. It's done like a Superman comic book. This was so successful, it got them so much free publicity and raised the value of their stock that in 1996, they did this as their annual report to stockholders. A, B, C, D, all about being connected to data. And it features Wally, who tries to do things, but he screws it up because he doesn't have Adaptech equipment. And then there's Molly, who does have Adaptech equipment and does much better. You also get the financials. Uh, you get to meet the president and the chairman of the board. Now, this may seem silly to you, but this childlike, very fresh approach, it gave them a brand. It made them stick out in the field, and it got them lots of attention, and as I say, raised the value. Even in the world of banking, if you think 20 years ago, no bank or insurance company would use humor at all. I know the chief financial officer at Capital One, and Capital One for the last, what, seven or eight years has been using lots of humor in their ads. Here's a company called Bankrate.com. You go online and you find out what mortgage rates are. Now, how could you possibly put humor into that? Well, here's an ad from Newsweek magazine. Um, in case you can't read that, it says, less than 2% of condoms actually fail. Every percent counts. <coughs> Uh, even the IRS has tried to get in on the act. Here's an IRS online zine. They're so hip at the IRS. And it's called Tax E. Get it? Well, there's a learning curve to humor, just like for many things. And the IRS is, is at the beginning. A guy who's made a fortune, a guy who's made a fortune out of applying humor to training is John Cleese from the old Monty Python group. Cleese in 1973 founded a company called Video Arts, and he's now by far the largest production company in the world for uh, training films. And he uses negative humor. He shows you how not to do something by showing what it looks like when it's really screwed up. The hero of this movement, that humor is not the opposite of play, excuse me, is not the opposite of work, is Herb Kelleher of Southwest Airlines. Herb Kelleher has been written up in many uh, periodicals, and there's whole books about him. Uh, here's a book called Nuts, Southwest Airlines, Crazy Recipe for Business and Personal Success. If you've ever ridden Southwest Airlines, you know the kinds of clowning that they do, and they get great attention for it. Um, in this book, Kelleher explains how sense of humor is the only thing that they absolutely require of employees at Southwest. He said everything else will train you for it.
When Kelleher faced problems, he's now no longer the CEO because he's in his late 70s. When Kelleher faced problems, he often used humor to get out of them. And let me give you an example from about 15 years ago. Uh, Southwest had just come out with an advertising slogan, and they had only been using it for two weeks when they got a call from another airline that said, that's our slogan. We've been using that for over a year. Now, how do you solve that problem in American business? Who do you call? Lawyers, right away. And how much is it going to cost? Millions. How much, is, how much time is it going to take? Okay, Kelher said, I don't have the time or the money to fool around. He said, I hereby challenge you, this is the other CEO, to an arm wrestling match in the Dallas Sportatorium. This is, <laughs> this is a rundown old wrestling palace, and here's a picture of the event. Uh, Kelleher at this time was already in his late 60s. Uh, he's a chain smoker. He also drinks a lot of wild turkey bourbon. Um, <laughs> here is his manager who has a bandiero across his shoulder. Only instead of little bullets in the Bondietto, he has airline-sized bottles of wild turkey bourbon. Um, <laughs> the guy from the other airline, this is a close-up shot, the guy from the other airline was 38 years old, had been a weightlifter and a wrestler in college, had never smoked, was in terrific shape. And as you saw these two guys come into the ring, it was clear who was going to wump whose arm. But Kelleher, for two hours, had his people in the stands laughing and cheering him on, go Herb, go Herb. And by the end of the, the fight, the other guy was laughing so hard, he said, well, you can keep the slogan, too. And he just let him have it. Now, this is not standard MBA training, but this is, this is the new kind of humor in American business. The guy who wrote the introduction to the book Nuts was Tom Peters, one of the most successful business consultants of all time. This is a Tom Peters book where he writes, Welcome to a world where imagination is the source of value in the economy. It's an insane world, and in an insane world, sane organizations make no sense. Now, he doesn't mean that literally. He doesn't mean you have to be crazy, but he means you have to be able to think in all kinds of new ways. When Herb Kelleher stepped down a couple years ago, the guy who took over Southwest Airlines is Gary Kelly. Here's Gary in the cockpit of a plane, dressed as Edna Turnblatt from Hairspray. Um, so he's trying to carry on the tradition. Now, I want to talk about the nature of humor and the benefits of humor in just a few minutes. So I'm going to give you a very cursory examination, but I hope you get the basic idea. I talked about humor as a kind of cognitive play. And by cognitive play, I mean a play with ideas, play with concepts, play with expectations. What kind of cognitive play? Well, I want to use a theory that Peter mentioned, and that's the incongruity theory. Humor is the playful enjoyment of incongruity. And incongruity roughly means something that doesn't fit your expectations, doesn't fit your mental framework. Simple example. Uh, two years ago, we had a bad fire in our house, and for a couple of months, I had to do all our laundry at a laundromat. The first time I went to the laundromat, I was loading clothes into the washer, and I noticed this sign above the washer. <laughs> now, the people who wrote this sign obviously didn't have a funny meaning in mind, but I thought of it an alternate incongruous meaning. The buzzer goes off and everybody strips. Uh, if you enjoy that mental jolt, that's what humor is all about. <laughs> Second example. Before we moved to Virginia, my family and I lived in Tampa, Florida. The day we moved in, there was this house for sale down the street. The day we moved out, the same house was for sale. The same sign was up. See if you can see any marketing problems. <laughs> now, to Bill Oder, the name Oder is perfectly normal because it's his name. But when you put Oder together with real estate in South Florida, not so good. Okay, uh, here's another example. This is from Smithfield, Virginia. I took this a couple weeks ago. Uh, on a trip, this is an attorney's office. Um, <clears throat> sometimes people put up signs and they, they know what they mean, but it's not clear to the person who reads it. Here's a wonderful sign. Uh, <laughs> here's another one. My family and I were traveling in the Adirondack Mountains and we came across this little store and it was the post office, it was a convenience store, it was the bait shop, it was where you got everything. So they put it all together on the awning of the store. Okay. You get the idea. Now, humor according to my account. Humor is experiencing something that you're not ready for, something incongruous. 
and getting a kick out of it. That is enjoying the mental jolt. Notice that you don't always enjoy the mental jolt. Sometimes when stuff happens that surprises you, you get angry or you get scared or you get sad. What's the difference between the person who is amused by incongruity, and here Pete's idea about a benign violation comes in, the person who enjoys it and the person who doesn't. Part of this is what Pete called psychological distance. I call it mental distance. The person who can enjoy something as funny can step back, can see it from a higher perspective. This I take to be the basic humor skill, and we'll talk about it. Let me give you as an example. Um, again, I go back to my son when he was in third grade. He's now a graduate student. I can't imagine that, but anyway, uh, when he was in third grade, just before the Christmas break, he came down with pneumonia, which is just terrible for a little kid. But he had a really good doctor, and she was uh, on top of everything. He also had a wonderful teacher, and Jordan's teacher had all of his little friends send him a get well card. In the first several cards that he opened, he was really starting to cheer up. But then he got to this card from Allison McAndrew. Dear Jordan, I don't want you to know this, but pneumonia can kill you. <clears throat> the next line, my wife and I read, so get well soon, your friend, Allison McAndrew. But Jordan sounded out, your fried, Allison McAndrew. Jordan's, the tears, the tears started to come down his little boy cheeks, and he said, Dad, that flower is dying. <laughs> and he said, is that in the cemetery or what? And then he put his head in his hands, and the tears were streaming under his fingers, and he said, Dad, if she didn't want me to know, why did she tell me? Okay. Now, my wife was laughing so hard she had to leave the room. I was biting the insides of my cheeks to keep from laughing in the little guy's face. I mean, he did have pneumonia, and thanks for the tip, Allison. Um, what was the difference between Jordan, for whom this was deep tragedy, and his mother, for whom this was high comedy? The difference was mental distance. My wife could step back. She could see it from a higher perspective. She could see two weeks from now when you're sitting under the Christmas tree open in your presence, this will be ancient history. Jordan had no distance at all. For him, this was the stress mantra, which is here, now, me. Here, no place else. Now, not the future, not the past. And me, I'm the center of the universe. If you make yourself the center of the universe, consider only where you are and when you are, then every little surprise can blow you out of the water as it did Jordan. Now, this idea of mental distance can take many forms. When I teach a course on this, this is two weeks, and I'm going to cram it into a minute. <laughs> uh, first is distance in space, as Pete mentioned. Something that's far away can be funny. Even if it were closer to home, it wouldn't be. Second is temporal distance, distance in time. Lots of things that you laugh about from when you were in high school, for example, weren't funny at the moment they were occurring. <laughs> but in retrospect, they get funnier. The third is personal distance. This is just the difference between you and me. If we're having dinner and you spill a big blob of ketchup on your shirt and it looks like a bullet hole, well, that's funny. If I spill it on my new $98 all-cotton shirt, 400 thread count, well, that's serious. As Mel Brooks said, tragedy is me cutting my finger. Comedy is you falling down a manhole and dying. So <laughs> I don't have to clean up your mess. So it's easier for me to laugh at your problems than it is for me to laugh at my own problems. So uh, last kind of distance is the distance of fiction. Here I rely on my friend Bob Mankoff, cartoon editor of New Yorker, who lets me use his cartoons. Uh, when something happens in a cartoon, it might not be funny if it were happening really. Let me give you a first distance in time and space. Here's some from, from our friends in Temple Terrace, Florida. This happened to their neighbor. Um, <laughs> I find this really funny, but not if I were at, in the house. Second example, uh, this is a, a, a Tom Chaney cartoon of cubicle problems. Now, all kinds of companies know that cubicles cause stress in people because people don't have privacy, et cetera. And, but here's Tom Chaney taking this and exaggerating. Exaggeration is the key skill in comedy. And <laughs> notice that this... Notice that this, as a piece of fiction, can be funny. If you were in an office and this were true, uh, would not so funny. 
Here's another example. There's a wonderful line to break up with somebody. I've used this at least twice. What you say to the other person is, it's not you, it's me. In that way, they can't, there's no comeback for that. Here's Tom Chaney's take on that one. <clears throat> okay. Now, you get the idea here. If this were real, it would not be funny, but because it's fictional. Now, the benefits of humor are many, and, is, and I'm running out of time quickly, but let me talk about uh, the health benefits. Uh, one of the first people that I met in this field, I was teaching at Santa Clara University, not far from here, and I met Dr. Bill Fry, who's now retired from Stanford. He was in the psychiatry department, and Bill Fry was one of the very first people to study the effects of humor and laughter on your body. First, work out for your heart and lungs. When you laugh really hard, you take in six times more oxygen than when you're simply talking. Secondly, pain reduction. They've done lots of tests on people who watch a funny video, and then they give them some pain like putting your arm in ice water. People who have experienced humor uh, can take more pain. Thirdly is muscle relaxation. In Bill's research, while you're laughing, your blood pressure builds up and your muscle tension builds up, and your heart rate builds up. But when you stop laughing and you come down that whoo moment, which is almost like an orgasm for some people, that relaxation, Bill has clocked, for up to 45 minutes in your heart rate, your blood pressure, and muscle tension. There's also a boost of your immune system. I won't talk about the laxative benefits because the food tonight was so good. And lastly, I want to mention stress reduction. I have a chapter in my book, Humor Works, called Humor is the Opposite of Stress. And I show how physiologically and also psychologically, as you pointed out, they're exact opposites. Now, I don't have the details, but, um, well, read the book. Uh, <laughs> when you look at all this stuff, uh, you can see how humor can reduce stress. Let me give you an example. When I lived in Florida, I had a dentist who was kind of an oddball, but he was a very nice guy. And you could tell it in the dentist chair, I was a real chicken shit. He had a wonderful way to give me my next appointment. Whoops. I've got it. Yeah. Whoops. Oh, here's humor is the opposite of stress. It reduces stress chemicals in the blood, epinephrine, plasma, cortisol, dopec. Stress suppresses the immune system. Laughter boosts the immune system. In stress, we feel like they're doing it to me. In humor, as Sigmund Freud pointed out, we feel like we've done something. We feel a measure of, of control over things. Okay, um, here's the example. Um, this is Dr. Eastler's way to give you your appointment, your next appointment. Now, this is a very mild joke. It's not knee-slappingly funny, but it's just, just about right. Okay, so the benefits of humor then, first of all, it's good for you physiologically and psychologically. Secondly, it is linked to mental flexibility. And that's my umbrella term for getting out of mental ruts, seeing things from several perspectives, having a positive attitude toward change and toward risk-taking and toward mistakes. People who are rich in comedy know that the world is full of lots of different kinds of people and lots and lots of mistakes. So this helps us see ourselves, as the old Candid Camera Show used to say, as other people see us. It's also linked to creative problem solving. Here I rely on the work of Alice Eisen in, the, in, in Cornell and a guy named uh, Avner Ziv at Tel Aviv in Israel, and I could give you lots of references. So first, humor makes us healthier. Secondly, it makes us more mentally flexible. Um, what's this? Okay, a bunny, a bird, a duck, a rabbit. A kumquat, okay? <laughs> Another word that starts with Q, please. No. Uh, notice that if you saw it one way, it, it, the OK sign, great. Scissors, anybody see scissors? <laughs> notice that if you see it one way, and then I give you another way, if you're mentally flexible, you can say, oh yeah, you can switch. The first time I did this, it was for a large industrial corporation. There were 12 plant managers sitting around a table. Alpha male was seated here. I said, what's this? He said, it's a duck. One of the underlings across on the other side said, looks like a rabbit. The first guy said, no, it's a duck. And the other guy said, yes, sir. <laughs> okay, that's the authoritarian, humorless personality. Here is a, a, a wonderful variant on this. This is the rabbit running as fast as it can possibly go to the right. If you want to see the duck, you have to put your head on your right shoulder. 
have to kind of lean over and see the. It's kind of a Harpo Marx duck. You got it? Okay, so the person with a good sense of humor can switch their perspective. They can see things one way and then see it another way. Notice the jokes. Notice the jokes. If, if, you did, if you're not able to see it, just I'll show you afterwards. Um, I'll tip the projector for you. <clears throat> Um, notice that the person who can see things one way and see things another way, that's the basic skill of getting a joke. Most jokes lead your mind along path A, and then at the punchline, you send you off onto path B. Mae West, 1934, said, marriage is a great institution, but I'm not ready for an institution. Uh, notice you, you reinterpret things. So humor and mental flexibility are naturals. They go together. Okay, I'm going to skip through several slides and talk about my last topic, which is humor as social lubricant. This sounds sleazy, but I don't mean it that way. What I mean is that humor reduces the tension. If I'm working with you and with her, we're not going to do things exactly the same, and that's human nature. If we take everything very seriously and if we're very protective of our own egos, we're going to get on each other's nerves. Humor allows us to admit that people are different and also to admit that people uh, make mistakes. So humor is excellent for creating rapport, good morale, and as I say, reducing defensiveness. Humor helps me to laugh at myself the way I would laugh at, say, you. And when you looked at the person next to you in their pad and the way they signed their name, glyph, dip, boom, boom, um, you had no trouble laughing, and most of you look back at your own, and yours was just as funny as theirs. So this is the basic humor skill, is you can laugh at others, see if you can laugh at yourself in the same way. Okay, I've, I've got 20 examples that I'd love to share, but I'm just going to limit it to a couple. One, uh, we were traveling a couple years ago, and we were in a little tourist area, that hit, and it, there were a gift shop, and there were a lot of glass and porcelain on lower shelves, and you could picture a three-year-old or a four-year-old going in there and just wiping out thousands of dollars of inventory. Now, you could just threaten the parents. You could just say, don't trip over this. No. You could just say, watch your kids, or if you break it, it's sold. But then people aren't going to want to hang around and buy something. So here's the sign that they put up and said. <clears throat> Same message, the same message, which is watch your kids, but because you get the people to laugh, it completely changes it. Okay, uh, as I say, I'm not going to give you a lot more examples. Here's one other field is debt collection. I do stuff for credit managers where humor is, it's, it's rare, but it's very valuable. Uh, most debt collection letters threaten the person, typically with uh, legal action. But consider this non-threatening middle paragraph from a debt collection letter. We appreciate your business, but please give us a break. Your account is overdue 10 months. That means we've carried you longer than your mother did. Um, <laughs> notice how when you do that to somebody, you catch them completely off guard. They laugh and they pay up. Uh, a program I did 10 years ago for a group of credit managers, there's a woman there who said she had this little rubber stamp made up. It cost her 10 bucks. She estimates it saved the company at least $50,000. And when an account is overdue, say third invoice, she just stamps this on the invoice. Hello there, I'm the company computer. So far only I know that you haven't been making regular payments on your account. However, if I don't process a payment from you within 10 days, I will have to tell a human. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. When you are in any social interaction where the other person might feel uncomfortable, if you use humor, you can greatly reduce the tension. I've been teaching now for 33 years, and I found out the very first year that if you use humor, you can get people to pay attention, and you can get them to open up. And I want to close with just one example. Uh, I've often taught adult philosophy and adult religious studies classes. And in one class, I remember, I wanted people to talk about trusting people, and especially trusting a spouse. Now, to get people to open up and talk about trusting a spouse, especially if they've had problems in the marriage, is almost impossible unless you add humor. So this is what I did. I dug this out of the Weekly World News. It's a tragic story uh, in its own way. Uh, woman divorces Siamese twin to wed his brother. Uh, this is always, by the way, in Bulgaria or Romania. It's never in England or Germany. Uh, an attractive buxom blonde has obtained a divorce from a Siamese twin in order to marry his more dashing and intelligent brother. 
Uh, Gerda Trabatov, they're always a buxom blonde. Gerda Trabatov married one Siamese twin, but then she found out that his brother was growing a little mustache and that he was wittier in conversation. And then the whole marriage just kind of declined. Within two weeks, literally behind her husband's back, they were fooling around. And now, after I presented this, after I've presented this and everybody's laughed about it, now talking about your marriage, piece of cake. Okay, so my idea here is to summarize all this stuff. Humor is experiencing incongruity. It's thinking of something or having something happen that you were not ready for, that doesn't fit your conceptual patterns, doesn't fit the way you see the world. But somehow you can enjoy the incongruity. Somehow you can step back, disengage yourself emotionally enough from it to get a kick out of it. Humans are the only ones who can pull that off. Try that with your cat. Get a really funny costume in front of your cat. <clears throat> you will not get laughter. Uh, humans are the only ones who can do that because of the way our brains are wired. And this is the basic skill in humor. The next time you have some crisis at home or at the office, ask yourself, what's this going to look like a year from now? Suppose it's still going to look bad. What's it going to look like 10 years from now? You've all got stuff from 10 years ago that was a catastrophe and now is funny. Well, the secret to having a good sense of humor is to shorten the lag time. You've all said to yourselves, someday we'll laugh about this. Well, my last question for you is, why wait? <laughs>